Hello. Our story begins on Coruscant shortly after Anakin returned from his mission to Naboo. The Clone Wars had begun. Anakin and Padme were now secretly married, and it was time to attend to what had been started on Genosis. Anakin during his trip from Naboo to Coruscant had a lot to think about. Of course, there was a new excitement from a new marriage, which was formed in less than a week old relationship, but there was also something else. He was thinking about the death of his mother, and what followed it. He went to a blind rage on Tatooine of sorts, and while he believed his actions were justified, and as he said to Padme, he was a Jedi, he knew he was better than this, if he could do something so heinous on Tatooine, what could he do elsewhere? There was a war beginning, and chances are he'd be fighting alongside clones on his own. What would happen if they landed on a Separatist world populated with people, and he snapped again? Anakin was never one for politics, but truthfully, it didn't seem like anything serious enough to slaughter another person over. Anakin sat next to his wedding gift, R2-D2, and pondered over this little dilemma. He looked at the droid and then back to the front of him. He would be a Jedi Knight soon, and he had no intentions on taking on a Jedi Padawan. He believed that the best way to attain the role of Master would be through trial. He knew that the system could technically be cheated if he didn't want to take on a student, which was very firm in his own belief overall. If he could pass his trial or whatever trials there were to become a master without having to teach a student, then that would be much better off for him, presumably. Anakin spoke aloud to R2 about this and the little droid just looked at him, beeping back when there was an opening. Though Anakin couldn't escape one minute detail, and it was what he did to the Tuscans. He heard someone cry out to him, he could feel the shifting in the force as he did it. The truth is, it sounded like Qui-Gon Jinn called out to his name, but he was unsure. Maybe it was him, maybe it wasn't, but it felt like the force bent in a negative way when he lashed out like that. What put off Anakin even more was the reaction it garnered from Padme, when he told her what he did. Truthfully, Anakin was surprised she even stayed in the room with him, or gave him a chance after he told her what he did to the village. He didn't regret it per se, he just hated the Tusken Raiders, but perhaps if he won any shot at becoming a Jedi Master through trials, rather than teaching, he should approach this issue and confront it head on. If he allowed it to simmer, he could be made weaker from it. Anakin grabbed his metallic arm and thought about that weakness. That weakness to have patience, to see things through, almost cost him and Obi-Wan their lives. His anger and arrogance cost him a forearm. If he had been patient as Obi-Wan said to be, they could have stalled long enough for Yoda to arrive, and then they could have ended the war before it even got started. This moment of self-realization is something Skywalker lacked throughout most of his Jedi training. He always thought Obi-Wan was holding him back by telling him to not focus on victory, but having lost as badly as he did on Genosis, and having been embarrassed, he realized that perhaps Obi-Wan was right. He'd be a knight upon his return, and it was time he started acting like it, though one question remained. One thought took over his mind, who? Which Jedi Master would be able to help him, or at least hear him through and then help him? There were a number of Jedi in the temple, and truthfully he didn't believe he should tell a single one of them. The ones on the council were supposed to be the wisest, but he didn't trust any of them. As for Obi-Wan, that wasn't exactly the case, but it already expressed his personal grievances with his master in the past couple of days. Obi-Wan seemed like the most likely candidate, but he'd have to think about it. When Anakin eventually returned to the temple with his brand new astromech, R2, he went to the council chambers where he was requested. He would speak with them before being asked to kneel in a ceremony of which he'd be knighted by the Grand Master of the Jedi Order. With Coleman Trevor being killed on Genosis, his spot was opened up into a rotational role that would be gifted to Obi-Wan Kenobi for having completed Anakin Skywalker's training. Despite the Council not taking Anakin on as their own project, they believed that the training of Skywalker, alongside that of Obi-Wan's personality, were key attributes to make a fine Jedi Council member. It was two high honors for the Master and Apprentice duo. After he was knighted, Skywalker ran across the city to tell his friend Palpatine about everything that happened. He would tell him the secrets of the marriage, the death of his mother, and the slaughtering of the Tusken Raiders, his knighting, and the fact that his forearm had been removed by Count Dooku during the Battle of Genosis. For Sidious, he saw all these little accomplishments or events in Anakin's life as stepping stones into creating the future Darth Vader. He would use the marriage to Senator Amidala against him, whether that be through her assassination or some unforeseen event. Palpatine would prop up the slaughter of the Tusken Raiders as just because he wanted revenge, something he would only begin to encourage Anakin to seek against Dooku. If Skywalker could exact his revenge against the aging Count, then he would kill two Womp Rats with one stone. Palpatine just placed all of his pieces where he needed to, and sent back a more confused Anakin to the Jedi Temple. It was funny, Anakin had the intuition to pick up on the fact that something was awry, but he never figured it out. He just knew that his older friend was giving him advice for getting what he wanted. When Anakin returned to the temple, everything was changing. The Order was moving itself into preparation for the war, and Anakin had to make sure he was ready himself. As a knight, it was kind of weird though. He wouldn't be tagging along with Obi-Wan anymore. He was sure he would see him, but as it turns out, the Republic would be assigning armies to generals. On another note, Skywalker is going to be assigned his own division. Apparently, is one of the tighter, more elite units in the Grand Army of the Republic. The Order is coming from the Chancellor, of course, who was the highest-ranking military official. 
As Anakin returned to the temple, he thought of approaching the Grand Master. But before he could, he learned that the Jedi Master had dispatched himself to Onderon to see if they would align themselves with the Republic during the war effort. Whether that would be successful or not, he didn't know, but afterwards he'd be going to other planets such as Twidarium. With Master Yoda gone, Anakin thought about approaching the Master of the Order, but he was unsure. His initial thoughts were the High Council, but he didn't know any of them that well, so instead of dwelling on it, he went to the training facility and began practicing. He figured doing so would help him get his mind off of things. Usually it helped, but it also helped fuel his fury. In hindsight, it seemed counterproductive to what he was going for, but right now, in the moment, he figured that he'd be able to find comfort in it. He turned on the training droids and got to work. While he was doing it, people walked by the training room, a couple of them popping in and watching from time to time, one of them being a youngling named Caleb Doom, who was on his free period. He watched Anakin in awe as Skywalker moved his lightsaber around, not taking much notice of the boy in the room. As Anakin was focusing on his practice, a Jedi Master walked in and called Caleb's name and told him that he was supposed to be meeting up with his class for a field trip. Caleb twisted his head and realized he forgot all about it. The class was taking their final trip to Mount Umate in the middle of the city, for the last time as a class. After this, they would split up and be taken by their respective teachers and instructors as they became Jedi Padawans in a war-torn galaxy. Caleb popped up and ran out of the room as Jedi Master Plo Koon turned around and watched Anakin continue doing what he was doing. He made his way to the bleachers and sat down. The only reason Plo was able to get Caleb is because the instructor saw him walking down into the training arena, and so she figured Caleb was probably down there. And since Plo was heading down there, if he saw Caleb, then he could redirect him. The instructor proved to be right as Caleb regrouped with her and the rest of the class and left. Plo watched Anakin as he shuffled around the room though Plo could see the anger still so present within him. Truthfully, he was here on behalf of the Council. Not that he was spying on Anakin or anything, but the Council made a point to themselves to keep an eye on Anakin as he moved forward into knighthood. The Council elected that they should give him a student. This was mostly suggested by Obi-Wan, but most of the Council was in disagreement with it. Plo Koon suggested little Soka for the potential pairing, and Yoda thought it'd be a good fit. Regardless, the Council believed that if Anakin was acting in an erratic way, members of the Council should inform the Collective Council about it, so they could keep a close eye on him. Obviously, due to the nature of this, Anakin was not to know about it, so Plo just sat quietly with his arm bent at the knees leaning forward and watching intently. Skywalker didn't lose focus, he didn't really even notice he was in there, but he was getting angrier. He was picturing the Tusken Raiders and he was thrusting his blade with speed and fury, catching a glimpse of his forearm only forced this to grow. Anakin hadn't yet found a glove for his forearm, so was sitting openly with his golden hand glistening under the ceiling lights. As the session finished, Anakin spun the blade around into a reverse grip as he prepared to start again. Plo saw this and spoke up, asking what was going on. Skywalker turned his attention to the quiet Jedi Master. He didn't know much about Plo up until this point. He'd been on the council for a number of years, but he was never one to speak in sessions, always sitting quietly, as if he wasn't present at all. Anakin just realized that he didn't even think he ever heard Plo speak to him, or just in general. Maybe he was wrong, but it seemed to be the case. He asked what Plo said, and he said it again, asking Anakin what was on his mind. Anakin looked around before deigniting his lightsaber and shrugged his shoulders, suggesting that he was probably a little on edge with the war starting. Plo stood up and told Anakin that once he lives as long as he's lived, he'll notice the same faces on different people. Anakin's face was similar to that of a former Jedi, one who acted with tension and fury, but showed mild regret for it once it had already been finished. Anakin looked on confusedly. For Plo, it was obvious, but Anakin had only just met Dooku. Plo asked Anakin if the Battle of Genosis troubled him. Anakin shrugged his shoulders again. The Jedi Master could see the tension and he backed off. He told Anakin that he didn't have to tell him if he didn't want to, but if there was something that needed to be shared, he was willing to listen. Plo turned towards the door and prepared to give Anakin his space in case he needed it. Anakin watched Plo walk to the door, and before the door could open, he called the Jedi Master's name. Plo stopped and turned back and asked what it was. Anakin said that he did something wrong. It was eating him up and he didn't know what to do about it. Truthfully, Plo expected something minor to come from this, but once Anakin said that his mother had been killed, he knew where this was going. Anakin started, and once he did, he didn't stop. It was deeply troubling to Plo. As a Jedi, he couldn't condone such actions, and truthfully, they should be punished. It was hard for Plo to not suggest something happened to Anakin in this situation, but it was clear Obi-Wan hadn't finished Skywalker's training to begin with. Perhaps it was the ignorance of the Council, but Anakin shouldn't be getting a student. He shouldn't even be a Jedi Knight. This wasn't disrespectful either. Most Jedi didn't become Knights until they were in their 20s, and Skywalker was only 19. The Council had their errors, and they weren't a perfect voice, but this was one of their flaws, having too much faith in Anakin. Maybe they should have less. Regardless, Plo decided against his better judgment to tell the Council. Instead, he sat back down slowly and asked Anakin why he felt compelled to do what he did. And after that question, he asked if it made him feel any better. The answers to those two questions would decide Plo's quandary. 
Anakin said he was compelled to do it because they killed his mother, or in layman's terms, revenge. The second answer was a bit of a relief. Anakin suggested that while he hated them, it brought him to tears. After he did it, he expressed that he felt as a Jedi, he was supposed to be better than this. To Plo, this was the one redeeming thing of anything just said to him. While Anakin had most certainly traumatized a generation of Tusken Raiders, Anakin wasn't beyond saving. His ability to display shame and even a bit of regret for his actions on Tatooine showed that at the very least he could come down from this. Plo asked Anakin to take a seat with him, and so he did. He told Anakin that those feelings he felt were not those of a true Jedi. According to Anakin, he recognized that, so what would he have done without having spoken to Plo about it? Or in other words, what would Anakin do about those actions if he hadn't had the courage to speak up? Anakin looked at the Jedi Master and said he would try and seize moments to handle situations in a more appropriate way. Plo nodded his head, and then asked if Anakin handled his training in an appropriate way. Anakin asked what he meant, and Plo told him that he could feel the darkness from down the hall, before he even entered the room. It was clear Anakin didn't recognize that a Jedi youngling was inside the room with him, watching him, taking in that anger. Anakin looked over to his side, not seeing anyone, and then realizing that he subconsciously noticed the little figure, but made no mental note of his presence. Plo then asked, almost rhetorically, if Anakin had handled the situation, as he said he would try to. Anakin shook his head, and said that he didn't. Plo nodded his head, and then said that he could give him the guidance, but that would include him joining his current battalion. While Plo wasn't married to the division he was assigned to, it meant a new Jedi general would be tasked with that force. It also meant that if Plo was going to help Skywalker, then he would be the general and Anakin would be the commander. Technically it didn't matter, but Plo's division already had a commander, whereas Anakin's only had a captain. It would make things simpler, and Plo also promised that if he did this, he wouldn't inform the council as to why. Despite his loyalty to the council, he believed that if he could be with Skywalker during this, it would make things easier for Anakin. They were both in agreement with this proposal, and Anakin actually felt some sense of relief. With Plo around, he wouldn't be the general of an entire army, which not for nothing was a bit of an overbearing task for someone so young. He'd be the youngest general of such a force in the Grand Army of the Republic. He did believe the Jedi suggested this, but as Plo explained, it was a chance for who put the Jedi into these roles. Instead of getting mad at Palpatine, he just saw it as Palpatine believing in him. Plo informed the council of this decision without hinting at anything else as the war openly started up. Plo and Skywalker would be on the front lines with Captain Rex, and oftentimes, early on, with Obi-Wan and Cody. By the time of the Battle of Christosis, the 501st had a reputation. It's not like two of the best pilots in the Jedi Order were flying with a small fleet anyways. For only having three Venators, they were the only division in the war who was taking the most victories out of anyone. Other divisions were getting crushed. This also meant that Plo was sharing the spotlight with Skywalker, and despite Anakin being recognized as the hero of the Republic, Plo Koon was getting a brunt of the attention as well, because he was a general something he expressed absolutely no care for. Anakin didn't understand, but the humility displayed by Plo was something he respected, maybe even something he would adapt. When Plo, Anakin, and Obi-Wan went to Christophsis, they were already well known as a triple threat, defense, mastery, and offense. They worked perfectly, and on Christophsis, another one was added to their ranks, thanks to a push made by Master Kenobi. Ahsoka would be gifted to Anakin to become his student, something supported by Plo Koon too. Though because Anakin was acting as commander, Ahsoka would be given the rank of Major, which technically still outranked Rex, but in his book, experience outranks everything. One of Ahsoka's first lessons, too. Plo would give this new duo time to get to know each other, considering he and Ahsoka were already well familiarized. The Battle of Christophsis would become an overwhelming victory for the Republic, something they prided themselves on. But it didn't stop there, because despite the arrival of Grandmaster Yoda with reinforcements, Plo's division was being shipped off to Teth. Well, a third of it was. Admiral Yularen and his capital ship would be taking three Jedi, Rex, and a handful of clones to capture Jabba's son. The Siege of Teth would be successful, just as the other battles in the war so far, but it wouldn't stop there, due to a counter-assault made by Asajj Ventress directed by Dooku. Though Asajj at this point wasn't privy to Plo being here, so when she showed up expecting a fight with Anakin and Ahsoka, the two Jedi she saw from her lookout, she was surprised to see Jedi Master Plo Koon is here as well. She also knew who he was. Asajj, being a former Jedi, knew of him, but she was not ready to face him down. Luckily for her, she didn't have a choice, because Plo was going to put an end to her little counterattack. With stiff resistance from Rex and the surviving clones, Plo Koon and Anakin worked in tandem during their first true lightsaber duel together as they beat back Asajj Ventress. She was very talented, very agile, and very skilled. However, the short training she had received from Dooku wasn't enough to bail her out of the situation. Because she didn't force Anakin and Ahsoka to another landing platform, the Jedi were able to get a Republic escort to Lauren's flagship, where they would be able to get Jabba's son to the medical facility immediately. The added benefit was a captured Asajj Ventress, thanks to Plo and Anakin. Once Jabba's son was taken care of, the Jedi prepared to depart for Tatooine. Before they could depart for Anakin's homeworld, 
Plo and Anakin would speak again. He noted that Anakin fought without patience, and while it was something he had corrected Anakin on before, during a lightsaber duel it was different. Anakin's commanding tactics, under Plo, worked effectively because they were military strategies against droid forces, but what Anakin did wasn't going to work against Dooku, and especially not a Sith Lord. Plo suggested that Anakin take a breather before he gets involved with a fight again. That was the word Plo insisted on using, breathing. Feel the force, trust himself. He'd be able to stop whatever was standing in his way. Anakin looked at Plo with a sense of awe, and then he asked to show him. Plo put his hand on Anakin's shoulder and brought him to the training area on the Jedi cruiser. Ahsoka, on the other hand, was still in the medical wing with Jabba's son. Plo showed Anakin how he found his peace. It started when he used the force to lift his lightsaber. Skywalker watched. His blade ignited. Plo pulled the weapon into his hand, and the light illuminated with the hiss of an ignition sounding in the chamber. He brought the blade before his chest, connecting himself to the crystal before engaging. Anakin readied himself, and while he couldn't see Plo closing his eyes, when his eyes opened, Plo moved forward quickly. Skywalker stepped back and blocked the strike. Plo was so quick. Despite his large stance and form, his slick moves made him extremely deadly as an opponent. He thrusted his blade forward with only a couple of swings and knocked Anakin off of his feet. All of his times fighting with the Master of Defense didn't have him prepared for this. Plo helped Anakin off the ground and told him that he would get it. Anakin shook off his shoulders and told him that he was ready. Plo shook his head, reminding Anakin to not seek revenge. While it didn't seem like it, he was pushing himself to avenge his defeat. The energy may have been positive, the attitude may have been innocent, but it was a habit. If he got himself into that habit of defining victories in action, then he would never have victory of mind. Plo put his blade on his belt as he walked towards the exit. Anakin looked at Plo as he moved away, saying the words to himself again and again. If he was in the habit of defining victories through action, then he'd never have victory of mind. What did that mean? Anakin dissected the statement and realized that if he was always chasing the physical victor, he wouldn't be able to see a learning moment when it was happening. Beating Anakin wasn't his goal. Plo was showing Anakin two things, how to accept the loss in stride while also to see every opportunity as a learning moment. If he could see anything as a way to learn, then he would grow as an individual. No one was a true master, not even Plo Koon, because there was always something new to learn. Once Anakin realized that, Plo had already left the room and had gone to the bridge. Skywalker followed him up there and told him how he finally understood it. Plo just nodded his head, expressing that there would be more time to learn as the war continued. Hopefully, they could have the war finished before the end of the year. There were a couple sporadic conversations between Teth and Tatooine, but as the Republic arrived on Tatooine, Plo and Anakin realized that there was something wrong. Plo gave out orders to two LAATs as they dropped from the sky. His plan was concise and simple. With Ventress captured, she wouldn't be an issue, and he had no intention of it being an issue. One LAAT landed not far away from the palace, while the other one landed out of sight. Four clones exited with Skywalker and Plo. Anakin holding a backpack as they walked towards the palace. Dooku rose from the sands telling the two Jedi that they shouldn't have gone. Anakin and Plo ignited their weapons and prepared for a fight. Anakin didn't remove the backpack, instead, he told the clones to spread out and get away. He didn't want them getting to the crossfire. Dooku started forward carefully, and Skywalker took note of what was said inside the Venator. The two of them moved around, Dooku steadily not making the same mistakes as Skywalker did on Genosis. Count Dooku looked around, watching the two Jedi before thrashing at Skywalker. He blocked effortlessly, defending the strikes made by Dooku. Plo moved in. He and Dooku sparred in the past, and having gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with him before, Plo was prepared when he darted backwards. The Jedi Master defended adequately, but Dooku's quick speed rushed Plo into a defense. Anakin rushed forward. On the other side of the sands, Ahsoka carrying Jabba's son was approached by Magna Guards. But thanks to the clones she was with, she wasn't alone, and they were able to quickly make work of the droids, defending Jabba's son and getting him to the palace. Dooku was becoming impatient, trying to draw on Anakin's pain to make him angrier, and it was working. He knew details that he shouldn't have known, which confused Anakin. How did Dooku know that Tatooine was a place of pain for him? There was no way for him to know that information. Plo noticed this too, but he quickly made sure it didn't affect Skywalker. Plo made an effort to get in front of the fight or push Dooku back. This effectively deterred the conversation, but Anakin was already too far in his head. He pushed forward and Dooku seized the anger, smacking Anakin in the face and swiping across his backpack. Skywalker fell to the ground as Dooku reacted with joy. He killed Jabba's son, and now the Huts would blame the Jedi for the deceit. Plo moved forward using all their strength, smacking down on Dooku's blade, forcing his hand to bend backwards, and the moment was taken as Plo ripped his blade upwards, cutting through both Dooku's hands and then a feat of power shooting yellow electricity out of his fingers. This surprised both Anakin and Plo, but it didn't matter. It was done. Plo told Skywalker to get to the palace. At the same time, two of the four clones with the Jedi grabbed Dooku who was basically unconscious, and put cuffs around his elbows and his ankles. It'd be uncomfortable, but who cared? The events on Tatooine could be war-defining. While Anakin clearly had much more to learn, he was closer than ever before to being what he needed to be as a Jedi. 
Plo inversely took Dooku back to the Resolute. The capture of Dooku and the Hutts aligning themselves with the Republic would be a massive blow to the Separatist movement, which was dwindling in the face of the war. With Dooku publicly shown being brought into Republic prison, and the Galactic Republic propping up propaganda referring to the Treaty in the Outer Rim, the Separatist Alliance caved in. Without a strong voice like Dooku, they started to fall apart. Led by Mina Bontiri, who had her issues with the Republic, the Separatists started to make an effort to end the war. Cities had only one choice, force the execution of the Separatist Senator, but by the time she was killed, she rallied enough support in the government to turn against the war effort. While some devout Separatists believed it was done by Republic commandos, most of the government wasn't here for conspiracy theories. The truth is, the war was costing people their lives, most specifically innocent people. They didn't want that, and subsequently the Separatists, which had been winning the war thus far, called for a ceasefire. The Republic Senate was relieved. Truthfully, after the failures of Mimban, Jabim, and the destruction of the entire 104th Battalion over the Abrogado system, which would have been Plo's unit, they feared a potential losing war effort. Palpatine was looking weak, and the Jedi weren't much of a help either. However, with the capture of Dooku and the securing of the Outer Rim routes being done by the Jedi, public trust was secured for the Order. Not that they noticed anyways. This put Palpatine into a weird bind. He needed Dooku to recapture the hearts of the Separatist government, but if he tried to free Dooku from prison, it would be a bad look. He couldn't risk a full invasion on Coruscant because that would fail, especially with all the Jedi present. He could theoretically kill the entire Separatist government with Grievous, but that would be counterproductive. While Mina's death was very integral to the plan functioning, he couldn't rely on the other Separatist politicians backing out of the ceasefire. This stressed him out even more, and at that there was a call for a vote of no confidence from Senator Bail Organa. Luckily, there were still enough members inside the Senate who still believed in Palpatine, though the margin was very slim. He needed to act fast. If he didn't, his plan would fail and set the Sith back centuries. The entire purpose of this plan was to outsmart the Jedi, and he had done that up until this point, so he played the long game. He allowed the ceasefire to begin, and he put an end to the act of conflict, even supporting it as if he was in full support of the idea from the beginning, though this backfired on him again. It made him look like there was a weak backbone on him. Sidious manipulated Grievous from the sidelines, while at the same time he had a bomb go off inside the Republic military complex, which killed about 100 clones, 20 civilian personnel, as well as Dooku and Ventress. This targeted attack was to ensure Dooku didn't speak up. The Jedi none the wiser anyways, especially after Dooku literally told Obi-Wan everything he needed to know about the Sith on Genosis. The Jedi were actively going out to the galaxy to help people in need. The Council stayed on Coruscant, but the relief effort allowed Anakin to get another perspective on his role as a Jedi especially with Ahsoka by his side. She really thrived in this environment of helping, especially without a conflict going on. She believed this is what the Jedi were supposed to be, and what they were supposed to do. Anakin did agree with this, and he was able to start seeing a new side to the Order, one that he hadn't ever seen before. Thanks to his instruction from Plo, for those very few early months, he was able to grasp a new feeling from what it truly meant to be a Jedi Knight. Well, technically a Jedi Master, due to having Ahsoka around, you know. As the months dragged by, the Republic became entrenched in debates with the Separatist government. Demands were put forward and some were reciprocated. Most were not. The trouble for Sidious is the fact that most of the Separatist government were loyal to Dooku. Without him, they were loyal to the government and to their people. The surge led by Mina was not in vain, and with politicians like Padme, Mon Matha, Anaconda Far, and Bail Organa leading the peace treaties on the Republic side of the debate table, the Separatists felt as if there was something to gain from this. But there was one clear thing they wanted which was Palpatine out of office. His margins were becoming slimmer by the week. He had had three votes of no confidence since the beginning of the ceasefire. It really troubled him, and without anyone else on his side, he was left with no allies aside from the temperamental Grievous, who was eagerly awaiting conflict again. Grievous having only spent so long with Sidious and Dooku was beginning to believe the whole Sith thing wasn't worth the time, and so he acted on his own. Palpatine didn't regret the death of Dooku or Asajj. The Jedi had been reported inside the military complex multiple days before his death. So Sidious thought the former Jedi would break. He never would. Sidious needed a way out, and he finally got his chance, though it wasn't the way he wanted it. General Grievous would break off ties with Sidious and use an old back route to Coruscant. It was something he found inside of Castle Sereno while he was looking for a way to break free from this elusive Darth Sidious figure. Plo, Anakin, and Ahsoka had just returned from a relief mission in the Outer Rim, when the largest assembled Separatist fleet in the Navy arrived at a hyperspace. At the helm of the largest ship in the fleet was General Grievous. While Plo's former division was killed by the Malevolence, the weapon had gone into hiding since its last killing spree. Nat was here to fight against the Republic fleet. This forced Plo and Anakin to do something erratic. Ahsoka was ordered to go to the surface and pick up the Chancellor, bringing him to the Resolute, where it could escape from the planet if need be. 
At the same time, the Jedi would scramble their fighters and attempt to counter the massive super weapon. Anakin and Plo were the perfect duo for this, but the Malevolence was already in the firing range, as it shut down the shields on a number of capital ships and ripped them apart. Because she was supported by a large fleet, she was untouchable, which is what Grievous wanted. On the other hand, Republic fleets around the core were notified and immediately redirected towards Coruscant. Grievous then launched an attack on the ground, which the Separatist government tried to call off. They wanted the war to end, and this would break all those treaties that had been put in place over the months. With Padme and her allies, as well as a number of Separatists on Mandalore trying to secure a treaty, it was clear this act was done by a rogue element. The fight over Coruscant was gruesome. Plo and Skywalker were joined by Windu and Sacy Tin, but it was only becoming increasingly difficult. Luckily, the Chancellor was secured by Captain Rex and Ahsoka Tano, who brought him to the Resolute, where he was able to be kept safe from the ensuing battle. That made his way down to the surface as well. The Jedi and clones fought valiantly on the surface, but in space, it was getting crushed. They had little to offer in resistance against the Separatist fleet, especially the Malevolence. Skywalker and Plo, through the heavy fire, were able to disable one of the heavy cannons on the Malevolence through their hasty flying. However, there was not a chain reaction from the explosion, considering the ship wasn't trying to fire the moment it exploded. This meant only bad tidings for the reinforcements who were blasted by the EMP burst upon their arrival from hyperspace. The debris field was mostly filled with Republic ships, but with reinforcements coming from every corner of the core, the Separatist casualties were growing. However, with direct word coming in about potentially more reinforcements coming to aid the Separatists, the Republic ordered the Resolute to Kuat, where it could be protected. Hopefully the Chancellor could be kept safe. Despite how the public felt about him, he was still technically the leader of the Grand Army of the Republic, which meant he had to be kept safe. Plo and Anakin pulled away from the conflict to escort the Chancellor away from the planet as Mace and Sacy picked up right where they left off. The Malevolence was beginning to soak up a lot of damage, and with Republic reinforcements coming in quickly, Grievous realized his greatest blunder was underestimating the Jedi, being that they were the ones to seal his fate before he could escape the Malevolence. The two Jedi landed inside the Resolute, and it launched into hyperspace. They looked for the Chancellor, as Ahsoka informed them that he was currently inside of the command center, overseeing the Jedi training arena. He chose this location because it was secluded, and he could oversee the battle happening over Coruscant, or at least that's what he told Ahsoka. Anakin and Plo looked at her and thanked her before making their way to the location. They needed to talk to the Chancellor regarding their plans going forward. There was no way of knowing if the Republic would defeat the Separatists over Coruscant, but if they couldn't, they needed to know his plans. Palpatine, on the other hand, was preparing to ensure his rule for the time being. He couldn't account for Grievous defying his orders, and now he had to adapt. Luckily, the Jedi wanted him away from Coruscant because if they didn't, he may have been captured by Grievous, someone who likely would have used his anger against the Chancellor. Sidney so stood inside the room alone, the last of the Sith. He was unaware of any Jedi being here with him aside from Ahsoka. He knew that the Republic had all but turned on him, and he needed them to become reliant on him. So he put up a hologram, getting a hold of Commander Fox on the ground of Coruscant. As he prepared to speak, the doors opened behind him. He turned around in a startle, dropping the hologram. He was no longer hiding his Sith eyes, and Plo noticed it long before Anakin did, throwing himself in front of him and eating a blast of lightning that threw both of them out of the room. It was a gut reaction, and as Sidious turned around, he realized he had stepped on the device in his quick action. Sidious growled. He would deal with the Jedi before he could call for reinforcements, still not privy to the fact that they had left Coruscant yet. He ignited his weapon and walked out. Skywalker no longer mattered. If he lost his empire, he wouldn't have anything. Sidious needed power. Initially, he believed Anakin would add to his own power, but he no longer felt as if that were the case. Now, perhaps there was a chance, but with Plo Koon here, that was unlikely. When he exited the room, Plo was on his feet, his lights were ignited, and he stood between Anakin and Sidious. As an elder, it was his responsibility to do so. Skywalker held his lightsaber and prepared for a stand against something he didn't understand. The Council had theories, but none of them developed past what Master Kenobi spoke about after Genosis. Now, it was clear that Palpatine was the Sith Lord. The two masters of the force engaged in a duel of the ages. Sidious's speed was incredible, and for Plo, to keep pace was only a miracle. Having gone toe to toe with the Grand Master in intense spars was one thing, but Sidious was going for the kill. Their blades moved at such incredible speed it put Skywalker into awe before he gathered his composure and launched into battle. His blade slammed into Sidious's before he was thrown back. So much more to learn about the blade. He hit the wall and watched the two duelists fight. Anakin moved in from behind as a second lightsaber ignited and blocked his attack. A laugh rang out between the three blades before Sidious leapt up, kicking Anakin in the head, and then using the wall to push himself forward. Plo staggered, but he managed to hold his own for a moment. Sidious slashed forward, cutting through the bottom piece of Plo's mask, clipping the bottom left of his chest and knocking him off his feet. Plo fell back. His lightsaber slashed into pieces, now defenseless. Sidious turned to the sound of rattling behind him. He looked back and saw a lightsaber raise into the air. He looked at Skywalker. What a true Jedi he was in this moment, holding the lightsaber and preparing for his final stand. Anakin didn't have his eyes open. Plo on the ground saw the lesson coming to life. 
He watched Skywalker ignite the weapon and hold it to his chest. He took in a deep breath. As he said, so be it, Jedi. The blade growled as he spun it in his hands. Anakin's eyes opened and he spun the weapon forward. Without missing a beat, Plo used electric judgment to blindside Sidious, which threw him forward, giving Anakin ample time to cut through Sidious's chest and drop him. Anakin stumbled forward as he heard Ahsoka running up behind. Plo placed his hand over his chest and leaned up against the wall. He looked over to Ahsoka and then to Anakin, noting that Skywalker was alright. He wasn't really sure what was happening, but he did something. Anakin looked at Ahsoka and smiled before asking Plo what just happened. The Jedi Master just nodded his head after taking a deep breath, telling Anakin that he started a domino effect. He would have brought balance to the Force with his actions. Anakin just smiled and slid down the wall. Ahsoka didn't really understand, especially with the dead Palpatine, but time would reveal everything. The siege of Coruscant was as close to Republic loss as it was to a Republic victory. The losses were staggering. Millions killed in the ground invasion, thousands dead in space, and a rogue fleet wiped from the face of the galaxy with a few surviving vessels. While Palpatine's death was a shock, the revelation that he could potentially be behind the war was enough to get the Senate to back the Jedi's disposition. While the ceasefire was interrupted by the Battle of Coruscant, one thing was apparent. The Separatists weren't behind the attack. It was a rogue nation, and with General Grievous destroyed, it gave the galaxy hope for a better future. Though something that helped the Republic accept peace was the fact that the Separatists ousted the Separatist Council, which included members of the Trade Federation, Techno Union, Commerce Guild, and other corporations. It became clear that aside from Chancellor Palpatine's greed, the issue at the heart of the Republic was the corporate greed that controlled their policies. With Palpatine out of the picture, the Republic could reunify, but the only remaining issue was the fact that the corporate structure had so much control within the Republic. It had been building for centuries, and it was time for something to change. The delegates returned to their speaking, and they forced the corporations out of their Senate. The only way to find the peace was by taking down every single faceless corporation that fed off the war. It may have been only months, but the price of the war ate away at so many. And because the Corps was directly affected by it, they had every reason to care, a reason to act, a reason to be faithful to their roles. The Jedi didn't get involved, but they watched as a Republic they had grown to know changed before their very eyes. It reformed into a Republic Yoda hadn't seen in centuries. Perhaps with change happening, finally, people of the galaxy find their peace and get what they needed. Inside the temple, Anakin was congratulated with warmness by the High Council. He was proud of himself, and the Council was proud of him too. He obviously had much further to go, and Plo would be an ally through that. With the war coming to such a sudden end, with the Mandalore Accords ending, Skywalker was able to be a master without the onslaught of a campaign. It actually did make his teaching a little harder though. Life or death situations forced Ahsoka to be even more present. Without it, teaching was a bit slower, more focused, and required patience. Anakin would find his happiness, first with his student, then with his partner, and finally, he would find it with his order. His disagreements had been justified by himself in the past, but with help from Plo and learning that his oldest friend or mentor had it out for him, Palpatine, kind of changed his view for the Order. He saw their actions as genuine as compared to Palpatine's which seemed selfish now. Anakin would trade Ahsoka for the next six years until she was 20 years old, when she would become a knight. By the time she became a knight, Anakin and Padme didn't have any children. The Republic positively had been reshaped, and because of the hyperspace lanes acquired by the Jedi, the Republic moved into the Outer Rim with Force and the clone armies. The other syndicates were crushed and dealt with swiftly. Obi-Wan during these six years returned to Mandalore and helped Satine with some of her issues with the Death Watch. Reminding them of their time when they were younger, Satine decided that, once the ordeal was over, she would say the word. Obi-Wan promising to himself that he would leave had she said the word would do as such. The spot that was left open became a rotational, and just as the Council did for Obi-Wan, they did for Skywalker, gifting him a permanent role in the High Council for his actions to defeat the Sith and help bring balance to the Force. In the future, Anakin would take on new students and even have two children, one being an older daughter and the other one being a younger son, separated in age by three years. The Sith wouldn't return, and their death would be solidified when Maul passed away in a trash heap far from the forefront of the galaxy. With Anakin joining one of his great allies, Plo Koon, on the High Council, the Jedi Order could move forward with purpose, being dedicated to the people of the galaxy and bringing hope to the hopeless, an order becoming once again Knights of the Republic. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Granddaddy, Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Anakush Dank Runner, CT7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, the Eternal Padawan, Malik, John and Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallik, Only Slayer 66, Mad Matter Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortis Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. If you want to support in other ways, go check out the Patreon. Sith Clone Wars out every Saturday. Super cool. If you want to see early access to the Sith Clone Wars or early access to the animations that you saw in this video, go check it out. They're pretty cool. Pretty rad. Anyways, let's talk about the story real quick. So this is kind of like what if Plo trained Anakin, but it's not. Uh, this is not the remaster. 
but this was like it was fun because you get to see like this different dynamic and that fo the focus i really want to focus on is like that peace in fighting that peace that a jedi should have when they're fighting and anakin doesn't have that peace he's always like so angry and he's always so like he's always charismatic and, it, and there's a positive way to look at that but as a jedi he has to you know not be that and kind of embody you know luke or even ben during their final moments that great sacrifice of being a jedi and so for him to choose that path at the end of this story where he he had to fight sidious was less of a choice rather something that was forced upon him right and so he becomes like this true embodiment of a jedi during that and that's all because of plo's teachings so anyways i hope you all enjoyed i love you all spread the love and always remember my friends may the force be with you